We are live. Woo! Woo! Okay. And the audience goes crazy. Uh, <laughs> they watch you in Berlin, you know. Berlin now, okay. Berlin, hello out there, everybody in Berlin, Montreal. Ireland, England, and other parts of Australia. Yeah, Montana. Montana. Yes, yeah, Montana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yesterday. They're too busy in Ottawa driving trucks at the Montana moment. Montana. Right. So um, that won't be happening anyway. Welcome to the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame. Everybody out there in Facebook, YouTube, and on the virtual world, and everybody here mm. tonight. I'm Thundercloud, Mum calls me James, washing away the garbage, leaving rainbows after rain, and I'm your MC tonight, <coughs> as every other night. And um, I'll begin by acknowledging country and the land that we stand on, being that of Camilleroy, banned by crossover, and acknowledging the continuing connection to the country of the elders, past, present, and emerging and also acknowledge that sovereignty has never been ceded. On that note, I've um, been down to Urala this week, and um, there's, um, well, since some people call me James, as in, and then others, my second name's Arthur, well, Captain James Cook didn't discover Australia, and I didn't discover a bookshop in Urala. Um, but I came across this bookshop in Urala that already existed and there was someone in there and um, he's got heaps of books because it's a bookshop <laughs> and um, it's really good it's, um, I've got all these books here of different um, poets Victor Daly um, a bit of uh, like just the Victor Daly book uh, a bit of Warren Khaki published in uh, 1944, um, and it's um, sort of a tribute to the mums and the women of Australia. Um, Nine Miles from Gundagai, a compilation by Jack Moses. Um, William Heiner's book, William Street, and Acacia Road by Terry Orlick, and I'll be reading some of them tonight to y'all. We're going to begin with um, my little walk the other day. I never really got to finish this, so it's just two quite trains. That's eight lines, two verses. Paul, welcome. Feel free to take that seat if you'd like. Drifting. I drifted down late one midsummer afternoon to a place named Mother of Ducks Lagoon. And a pair of wood ducks were waddling there, while a flock of glass flew through the air. Reed warblers were singing in the long reeds, willy wagtails, butcher birds, magpies and lorikeets. Puffy marshmallow clouds float in azure sky, swans, ibis, herons swim, fly and wave by. Oh, that's it. What year was that, mate? Uh, 2022, about three days ago. Oh. I wrote it three days ago, yeah. Beautiful. Oh. Um, so I'm not going to do the next one out that I've written this week. I actually used some paper this week to do some writing, not my thumbs. Mm. Not my thumbs. I'm going to start with... Um, there, mate. Yeah. Yeah. Victor oh, no, Daly. Have you, have you ever actually seen the handwriting of people under the age of about 30? Mm. It's atrocious. Yes. Oh, it's absolutely it. messy yeah. and almost illegible. Yeah. Written yeah. often in capital letters and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I'm sure Victor Daly didn't um, write in capital letters. Even I mean, in modern day. 30s. Young, young people under 30, they've yeah. got terrible handwriting. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Victor Daly, um, a little bit about him, um, he's a poet. We like them. That's it. <laughs> I said a little bit. Um, this is a, a rather long bit of poetry, um, and it's called The Quest of Brahma. 
Once upon a hushed red morning, in the wondrous years of old, when the sun rose like a rajah clad in robes of gleaming gold, and upon his land of India, poured the largest of his heart by the Ganges, stood a Brahmin, far from all his kind apart. Darkly on that royal dawning gazed the Brahmin, saw, distraught, and his body lean was shaken with the passion of his thought. Many years with hands uplifted, till they withered in the air, I have prayed, he cried, to Brahma, but he heedeth not my prayer. I have prayed and I have fasted, waiting ever for a sign, while the world went reeling past me with its women and its wine. The burning suns by day have scorched me, freezing stars with icy spears, they have pierced my brain at midnight through the long and lonely years. I would lose my soul in Brahma, who is soul and life and breath, not to me a human shadows flitting by to empty death. I have done with prayer and fasting, lest the years go in vain go by. I will search the world for Brahma. I will seek him till I die. Thus, the Brahman spake, then swiftly journeyed up the Ganges stream. All around him reeled the riot of a strange, phantasmal dream. Rajas proud he saw returning from the wars in regal guise, their turbans blood red rubies gleaming over gleaming eyes. Royal elephants that slowly marched with trunks in pride, up curled and the spearmen and the banners and the glory of the world. And amidst the great processions, captive kings in fetter born, while the cymbals clashed with triumph and the trumpets blared with scorn. Then he passed with eyes unheeding and all their glorious array, for he knew they were but shadows that grim death would sweep away. Never sight of human sorrow, never show of human pride, edge of sword or smile of woman turned him from his path aside. Yet he stayed by still dim waters of whose breast the lotus blooms, flower of secrecy and silence gleaming midst the temple glooms. All in vain he searched the temples, where in many a form and guise in the dim vast halls the idols stared with soulless jewelled eyes. I will seek, he cried, for Brahma, midst the everlasting snows where the holy Ganges river from his awful forehead flows. To the far off peaks he turned him, leaving homes of men behind, driven onward by his yearning as the flame before the wind. Hunger gnawed and fear pursued him as he climbed with sobbing breath and above his head, unsleeping, hovered dark, the vulture, death. Ever downward plunged the torrents in a fierce and foaming flood, roaring through the gloomy gorges like a people mad for blood, rose the white moon like a spectre, all with ghostly light aglow, shining on a lonely shadow midst the Himalayan snow. Rose the sun in opal glory, Still the shadow lingered there on a ledge above the eagles in the vast blue void of air. Long the Brahmin stood and gazed on India lying far below. Like a Maharani dreaming evil dreams of war 
and woe. And he felt his bosom thrilling with a fearful pity then for the fierce unhappy nations, for the wretched sons of men. All this woe of old passed by me as I cry upon the wind, Brahma is no god of mercy unto hapless humankind. Or perchance the fate that rules us rules him too through endless years and the Ganges flowing seaward in the flowing of his tears. So he spake, then upward struggling, came at last unto a plain, cold and silent, white and awful, far above that hurricane. And amidst it gleamed the fountain where the holy river flows, and beside the mystic fountain bloomed a red and lovely rose. Never wind its leaves did ruffle, never breeze dispersed its balm, as it blossomed there still glowing, blossom of eternal calm. All the plain was white and silent, blue and silent was the sky, and the Brahman in his anguish by the rose lay down to die. Now the end has come, he murmured, lone I die amidst the snows. I, he, I have sought in vain for Brahma. I am Brahma. Breathe the rose. Mm -hmm. uh, long ago. Have you now do one of Have you got a no, time for it? No. Uh, no. Um, wicked, probably. It was published in um, Angus and Angus and Roberts Books and Bush, published mm -hmm. in. Uh, 1963, um, and it's a compilation of his work between 1908 and um, 1911, I'd say, of all of his yeah, work. Yeah, that's what I feel What's like. his name again? Victor Daly. Victor Daly? Mm. Victor Daly. Mm. E-Y? D-A-L-E-Y. Oh, he was right. quite a character, evidently. He sure was. Now, yeah. I'm going to, um, yeah, he's got he's some really good bits of poetry in that book, and that was just one that really resonated with me, just the whole, the whole idea of it. Mm -hmm. mm. This one here, um, in this bookshop in Urella, I went in and I asked, where's the poetry section? He pointed there, and there's this whole bookshelf of, like all this Australian poetry and then all this international poetry. But as I went down it, there was this little pile sitting there of like thin pamphlets like this. And pretty much that's what most of these are. Um, kind of rare things that there was only ever maybe a hundred or a thousand copies that not much exist anymore. Um, this is uh, a sprig of wattle, the book and other verses by Philip Norman. I've just got to be quite careful with it. Published in 1913, so it's mm -hmm. 109 years old, this bit of paper. So, um, yeah, it's got to take it wow. easy. There's only one, two, three, four, five, six bits of poetry in it, so mm -hmm. 12 pages, um, <coughs> with Sprig of Rock, Wattle being the first one the title poem, and it's the shortest of the lot. A sprig of wattle. Just a sprig of yellow wattle, whence it might move to move me so. Why on brow and cheek this mantle does it raise of ruddy glow? Why does sight of planet so humble cause the tear from eye to flow? Why does hand that holds it tremble, shaken by its spirit so? Other plants, you say, are nobler, other blossoms fairer be, but I will allow no other half so fair appear to me. 
fairest symbol of my country, fairest plant on Austral's moor. While I while love lasteth, I will love thee, till I love will love no more. Yeah, I'm just going to do a quick uh, whip around and ask who is going to do some reading tonight. Saul, Gabriel, okay. I won't be very long, I've got two pretty short. Not, not, like not Gladys. I'm just sitting back. Not Ronan. Paul. <laughs> yeah, oh. I should get to yeah. me out tonight. <laughs> Susan? <laughs> yeah. No? Okay. I'm just taking right. you all in tonight, too. Yeah. I'll take you all in. Alright, I'm going to take that opportunity to step back and uh, invite Ashley up and Ashley up. You've got her. Come on, Ashley. Pick, 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 whack, play him. him. Okay. Um, it's interesting because so the, the piece I wrote tonight has some sort of echo of um, the mood that Victor Daly brings forth in that poem, Brahman. And it's always worth remembering that English language people of that era grew up with um, the great poem about Buddhism, um, The Light of Asia. Do you remember a professor who wrote that? The Light of Asia? But anyway, it, it, nearly every household had a copy of this poem, and it goes parallel with the uh, visions of things. It's only the visions it. of... Um, it's a white one, I think. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. The, the visions of Victor Daly. Um, mm. So, I will start with uh, <clears throat> a piece that John Anano uh, wrote to me that was sent to him by uh, Baza the Badge relating to last week's comments about the red, white and blue in um, Central Park. The journal of John Anono, Baz and I were having... Please read this to your appointed auditors, Baz of the Baz went on. Please do, and oh no. I make three objections to your Australia Day aspersions of yester week. I do not look for green and gold banners and bunting to spruik the simplistic red, white and blue triumph of our Anglo realm. No, I, Baz of the Baz, was merely pleased to observe that us Aussies were reinforcing our cultural roots in Central Park on Australia Day, taking out spiritual insurance, strengthening our alliance with, can't make out what he's written here, um, has Baz, Baz of the Baz written pirates or irators? Realm, is it helm? He's not a good uh, calligrapher, Baz of the Baz. And we now, at this time of potential conflict and competition, need to be circling the barrels. Uh, what is meant by barrels? He must mean wagons or alcasses, or is it orcasses? Regenerating at the bottom of the sea, raise your glasses, gentlemen, as we rest under billions of tons of water, evading missiles launched at us from the satellites revolving. We are sacrificing for the preservation of the international rules-based order as we sit here at the bottom of the oceanic, raising our glasses, at the nadia of the interminabilities, under the oceanic, prepared for the imminent. It got a long word here with a stroke through it, so that long word with the stroke through it is what we're imminently waiting upon, it seems. Can't make out the next word. You see, as you know, John and Ono, you and all our auditors are either with us us or against us. Victory is no half measure. We wouldn't have tamed this continent if it was a half measure. It's a whole half measure. Oh, no, no, it's coming to that. You're with us or against us. Remember with your disparaging remarks, John and Ono, about the tree uh, tricolour being the revolutionary froggy thing, that our true British redcoats put bony down. We had victory then. Packed him to a little rock, we did. We did. One day, perhaps... Oh, Baz of the Baz is getting very articulate uh, here. Oh, no, no, we may, when our victory over the forces of 
Orientalists, Oriental despotism is assured. Return to a colour-coded national display of both green and gold and the royal austral red, white and blue, sharing our eyeballs on the emerald sward of Armadale Central Park once again. This is my exhortation for the season. Onwards to victory! And when achieved against the innumerable whores, no, no sorry, uh, the innumerable hordes, no hordes, Baz is right in style. It's, a, it's like jumping into a swimming pool of spaghetti. He, he wouldn't like that Italian oh, metaphor. Yeah. We, we may relax into our acceptable liberal multi opportunism, stroke multiculturalism. Again, I'm having difficulty interpreting. Um, that's the end of uh, Basil the Baz's exhortation to us this week. But I must add, on behalf of John Anono, you notice there is no mention of um, John Anono's point from last week, the discrepancy between the green and gold for decking our athletic Olympic efforts and its vanishing from our national emblems and rituals on uh, sacred days like Australia Day. Now, there's a certain prophetic ring to that um, note from Baza the Baz, is there not? Uh, I like to write aphorisms. So this is one, <clears throat> I dawdled and doodled and nearly crashed as I was going along in the car. I thought I'd better write it down before it leaves my mind. Uh, sorry, sorry. What bowl of sweet grapes, what bowl of sweet grapes Looking forward, I was, turned sour to vinegar over all our wounds. Well, that got more response and, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and laughter and clapping than um, Basil the Baz's exhorting. Okay. Just remember when you educate your children and grandchildren, make sure they know the difference between a tree collar and a tri collar. <laughs> well, um, two little vignettes that happened this afternoon at Gyra that make Gyra what it is and isn't. Some boys were crossing in the mist and cold before I walked up here to rich form and poor form and do my words with the English language. And unbelievably, this is Gyra, this is why we're here right now, these little boys crossing on their push bikes. They must have been seven and eight year olds and one of them shouted out, ride, ride boys, as if your life depended on it. <laughs> I kid you not. This little eight-year-old boy with his two mates crossing, crossing <laughs> into the car park there on their tricycles, shouting out, "Ride, ride, boys!" as if your life depended upon it. <laughs> it was like um, a remake of uh, the man from from uh, Upland Gyra. <laughs> okay, let's be serious. Let's be serious. I'll sing a song and then I'll do my Astley Falls poem. Uh, this is in homage to A. E. Houseman, who I loved as a boy, and as a boy, I still love A. E. Houseman. <laughs> With ruin my heart is laden for many a golden lad, for many a light foot maiden and many a light foot lad. By brooks too broad for leaping the golden Boys are lay, and the rose-lit girls are sleeping in fields where roses fade. Beautiful. Ooh. Yes, I think I right. threw my heart as lady for the golden friends I had, for many a rose-lipped maiden and many a light-foot lad. By brooks too broad for leaping, <coughs> the light-foot <coughs> boys are laid and the rose-lipped girls are sleeping. In fields where roses fade. Another little uh, poignant vignette. I went to the pie shop. I do indulge in pies. Oh God, forgive me, vegans, forgive me. And um, I was chattering, and I said to a fellow, all masked up, as I was Ned Kelly. I was reading this morning. I said that there's a fourth wave. This is worth listening to. There's a fourth wave coming of. Uh, type of COVID complaint, 
And the article said that there was a fourth wave of the Spanish flu, which people couldn't cope with, so they disrobed the system and many died unnecessarily. And it's never mentioned in history books. And as this chapter, this fourth chapter took place, it was never mentioned at the time. And the essay I was reading saying there's a fourth wave come, so don't be too um, jocund. It's nice to have people in front of you saying jocund. The English language is a rich thing. Well, this fellow <laughs> turned round and he said, I know about the fourth wave. And I thought, oh, bugger me, only in Gaira, <laughs> across the pie counter, does someone say, I know about the fourth wave. And he said, sadly, yes, um, at Manila, um, my, um, a mother and father and the two children in my family died when they got the first fourth burst of it. So I had two little vignettes tonight from from Magaira. Mm. Here we have a poem I wrote. I'm going to do a whole set with some paintings and drawings related to um, the magnificence of a Astley Falls. Um, and this is called Astley Falls by Midnight. Now on tour we gaze, remnants on the abyss edge of Apsley Falls. Boulders geometrise on the canyon floor, vast sided dice await the next slate cliff avalanche, as they were stranded once from one. Aha! Moonlit night, boom, there it goes. Bottlenecking a gorge country twist down to plains and sea. That constipated clattering of rocks along. Floats will sweep, floods will sweep, have swept away, tumble, rumble, we gaze upon. Leaving a cast still the rock, where others were born away, bear down into it, bear down, like a Zen sage mind, that monolith askew walled by moonlit slatiness. We do not need to look askance, the starred azure glanced over us, the sky, the tour. Mm. Mm. And uh, I thought I would finish with an observation and some calligraphy. <clears throat> I used to love to watch Chinese tourists what, hop out of a bus and look at a wall of Mao Zedong's calligraphy. Oh yes, they hop out of the bus and stand in rapture and in rupture. <laughs> this gives me pleasure. I have a simple mind. <laughs> it's going to look very strange too, <laughs> like a German seven if I crossed it. Okay, here goes. 200 years from today, special celebration invite from James Warren, all poets, to return here on the dot to Gyra Poets Hall of Fame to scribe together two, 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 do, 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 do. <laughs> all time, first time, last time. So very true. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I got this phone on. Tell us next week probably. What's really weird is that uh, you have thought is that at two twenty two on the second of the second, twenty twenty two today, I actually put a, a post up on Facebook exactly that. It just said two twenty two Did you do two, that on Facebook today? Yeah, but with a zero. Two oh. zero there. And and then, that is funny. Just as you were leading into that, I've seen this notification from Amar Mabu, who is a poet who performed here. And he said on that post, Will humans be around in 200 years? My reply was, in, That's only two, oh well, no, yeah, yeah, on the Tw two, 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 that 2020, 22, 22, and I, my reply was that's only 200 years 
we've been in two million so far. So well, it's only a hundred years back to Manila mm. and the tragic death of the mum and dad and the two kids. Mm. That's a hundred years back, and we're chattering mm. about it in the pie shop. So yeah, two million years, another two million to go, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> I, I often get uh, a bit amazed about the fact that people worry about, you know, 2050, you know, uh, resources exactly. and that. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, like, maybe a bit longer sighted than that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it might be a good idea. Yeah. Um, so, um, well, hopefully the Chinese will get fusion out of the confusion. It looks as though they might get fusion. I was, that, that would be, I was going to save this one for later. Then? But because <laughs> you did one about the fourth wave, I'm going to do this one now. Now, here's Good a panda. On, here's a panda. On, there's Good a panda, on, right? You don't have to be. There's a panda for all the people out there. <laughs> oh, melancholy mm. critter. Yeah. Now, I'm not going to do my one called Panda Mick. Because Panda Mick was feeling sick. <laughs> Don't panda to us. No, 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 no. no. Um, but this is this is actually dedicated to all the poets here. Um, because yeah, everyone's welcome to come here to poetry night, and you don't have to be a poet. Anyway, this is called "You Don't Have to Be a Panda." <laughs> you don't have to be a panda or a poet, to talk about love, express it and show it. You can give a little, little bit of care with or without any hair. You can jump on a chair and wave your hands in the air. You don't have to be a panda unless your name is Mick. Panda Mick is a poet and his verses are fully sick. He writes about butterflies, birds and bees and how he loves bamboo shoots and forest trees. You don't have to be a panda to go to open mic. My mate Rob comes on his mountain bike. And Gladys has a hike and walks to open mic night, shares the stories of the past much to our delight. You don't have to be a panda. I think I've found a theme. Steve, Paul, Doug and Saul are some of the poetry team. Ashley may be there in the panda's favourite chair. You don't have to be a poet to come and just sit there. No. Not finished. You don't have to be a panda unless you are a panda. Most mainstream media parrots propaganda. <laughs> Come appreciate the poetry if you like it, show it, and open mic all are welcome, pandas and also poets. You don't have to be a panda to get up off your ass. Well, this poem was going well, but now it's got no class. <laughs> poets write of love and also sometimes turds. Everyone is welcome to come to Wednesday Words. Woo! Thank you very much. That's my dedication to all of you poets here tonight. And um, I'm going to go on to Acacia Road because the last one was a sprig of wattle. Um, now, Acacia Road here is written by Terry Orlick. This was published in 1970. Um, all right. Um, now, it was um, Terry Orlick's first book of poetry. Um, he was a Tasmanian. Um, and there's a, a bunch of poems written between 1966 and 1976. Um, so it's probably even more recent than 1970, actually. 1976, yeah. Um, and Acacia Road. I'm just going to do a couple out of this. Seaside Town. In the general store, the boards don't echo to the splat of bare feet now. And the milkshake machine has sat silent for weeks. The girl in the shop was a friend once. When winds shriek in the darkest days of the month, 
I take a look at her child. He has my red hair and eyes like a book, self-conscious and too busy to be true. She thumps the cash register as if I were there only for groceries. <laughs> oh, how do we escape that? How do we escape that? Yeah. It's a reality, isn't it? The meadow. Talk all night about the men who admired your hair, the prowess of your mind, the ones who courted your youth, the length of your loving, your eyes. The cows are softly in the meadow, I hear them and will tell you anything, for the crocuses are out, and spring gives a lie to all tongues. Finally, this one's called Poet. She was always Daphne, or syntax of flower names, pirouetting encapsulated in light. Beyond the world of touch, she dipped, she glided, she stalked, she never walked. At least in the first volume. It took three books copiously stuffed with Dionysian tears before she finally disappeared from his poetry. I met her the other night across the shag-piled sitting room. Still waters of the Derwent were offering captive yachts to the grinning moon. She was silently but obligingly plump. She talked about sending her kids to private school and how she Loved her garden. Now, I like the man much more, finding him almost human in his self-deception. So I kind of won't appeal to you. Yeah. He's a cynical lad. Mm, he is. Um, well, look, on that note, Saul, would read you us like some to... Chuck Dunley. Yeah. Read us some Chuck Dunley. Oh, oh, no, no. Oh, oh, so, no, no. Mm. Yeah. He stretches the mind, the old tug. Oh, yeah. Come on up. Saul Caffarella, everyone. Yeah, I've got um, some things. I've got two totally, totally different worlds going on here today. I sort of found this well, a year or two ago, but I found it at home. And this is Bill Kearns, and he's sort of. Oh, yes. uh, yeah, he's uh, down the coast. Yeah, he's yeah, yeah. down the coast, you know. And there was just one in here that I just thought was pretty good, you know. I, I thought, yeah. Okay. <coughs> the diagnosis. Fred was feeling pretty crook, crook, and his poor wife was getting worried. So she bundled him into the car until the doctor hurried. <laughs> The doctor gave him the biggest checkup he had in his whole life and sent him to the waiting room and said, send in your wife. <laughs> <laughs> the wife went in and the doctor kindly sat her down and said, your husband's lifestyle doesn't, if, if your husband's lifestyle doesn't change in three months, he'll be dead. No more early mornings. Let him sleep in until nine and cook him a good breakfast. Eggs and bacon would be fine. <laughs> With all the little daily chores, don't worry his poor head. It's better that you let him play a round of golf instead. Perhaps with daily massage, you can tone up his physique and make mad passionate love to him at least three <laughs> times a week. <laughs> The lady thanked the doctor 
and went back to the waiting room to poor Fred, who was waiting in a fear, uh, with a fearful look of doom. He asked, what did he tell you? What directions did he give? And she replied, I'm sorry, dear. You've got three months to live. <laughs> Right. Oh, that's that. Right. 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 Like you, like your sense of you. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. It, did, it did strike me. <laughs> so this is a total change of sort of um, feel and everything. This is, uh, I have been fascinated a bit about, you know, like, um, I always, I have this bit of a philosophy about rainbows and stuff that, uh, you know, we're all, it, if you've got 10 people st sitting on the ridge of a hill all looking at a rainbow, everybody's looking at the same phenomena, but every rainbow is their own rainbow. You know? mm. And I sort of see that a bit like life. Mm. So that in the thing, the chakras are sort of labelled in the rainbow colours. Mm, and, yeah. and I call this one um, the prism of the soul. Wake. Healing is done. Draw back the curtains. Greet the sun. Let the light in. Disguised in the light. Red, orange, yellow, green. Blue, indigo, violet. Let the light in. Red. To drive passions of life's connection to roots. Let the light in. Orange, cares only for sexy hips that sway emotion to create a desire. Let the light in. Yellow, gives guts to who we are and take what we need. Let the night light in. Green, seen in all that lies without. Give and love with a heart that has no doubt. Let the light in. Blue. Let's truth spill forth and stops our head from floating off to indigo. <laughs> Let the light in. Indigo. Imagines everything it knows and sees between the eyes into everything unknown. Let the light in. Violet. Wears the crown and vibrates close to God. Embracing all its fellows for balance. Let the light in. The whole colourful sweep. Then close the curtains. Let darkness preside. Sweep. Last night. I would have liked to film it again. Okay. Love, um, the next love the ending. Yeah. Well, the beginning, um, however you want to look at it. <laughs> well, letting the light in, what about emitting the light? The latest research comes that um, humans emit biophotons. So they put us into, they put people into these lightless rooms with cameras that pick up small amounts of light. And um, about four o'clock in the afternoon, we emit the most light from our body, <laughs> um, which we take in photons, but it's our DNA. Um, it's something like a hundred million, a hundred thousand um, react chemical reactions within each cell every mm. second or something ridiculous like that, but yeah. each DNA emits one photon which holds all of the information needed to carry out those things and that photon then goes into the quantum field and um, communicates with the other photons that are being emitted to tell the rest of the body what to do. So what you're saying is we're LEDs, eh? Pretty much. I'm <laughs> <laughs> emitting diodes. Well, that's right, yeah. Um, so on that note, I'm going to um, invite Gyra's light on the hill all the way from the convent garden, which is Gyra's um, best little secret. 
Um, just out on the highway out there, they've got a wonderful um, statuary, I guess you call it, or uh, where they make statues, um, gargoyles, big vases out of concrete and stuff like that. Um, so if you're up here, check it out. And if you're not up here, go out there and check it. Come up here and check it out too. So Paul Wood, um, after that I'll ask um, Gabriel to come up. Um, Doug, then Ali, <coughs> finish off with Steve. Yeah, all right. Um, Paul Wood, everybody. Well, I'm going to say Thunder Cloud, uh, if you haven't heard it before, you might never hear it again, the check's in the mail. <laughs> um, now, tonight, tonight I've uh, run a bit dry again on the great songs of the South, and uh, I'm going to uh, climb back into uh, old English, uh, sort of folky sort of a song, still like a span song, in lieu of doing nothing. I'll do something rather than nothing because uh, the easiest thing in the world to do is nothing. It's also the safest. <laughs> um, now, on this one, I'm going to ask the poets to uh, maybe help me with a chorus. It's got a hammy, jolly old uh, chorus. The chorus is, uh, in old songs, actually uh, uh, called on work. Uh, when the chorus came, uh, people worked. Uh, someone would sing a verse and relax and then when the chorus kind of weigh the anchor or shave the weed or something like that. And the chorus of this song, the chorus of this song is, I don't even know it myself, I have to, I have to read it. <laughs> uh, it's, oh, the dal, the dal, the dal, the dal, the dal, la, la, the Oh, the Dero, the Dari, sing Turalara. It's a, a common sort of a chorus, right? So th this song um, is what they call uh, um, uh, a wassail uh, in Old English uh, times. And this is a reminder uh, in the words uh, of, of the class system of England, which we come from, and the emancipation uh, of, of the feudal system where people were basically enslaved and owned by the, the, either the monarchy or, or the barony. Mm. Uh, they did have money or payment of a kind, but it was only for tax purposes they were owned. Mm. And the great emancipation of mankind really happened in modern times and the great philosopher and futurist Karl Marx, forget about him being a communist, and a great, uh, the great uh, economist and linguist, and polemist of the time said that the greatest revolution of mankind was the Industrial Revolution. That was the beginnings of, 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 of true enlightenment. And by the way, our nation was founded in the times of enlightenment. Enlightened men came here regardless of how they thought <coughs> about in, in, in woke revision. So this one is... Uh, Oh, the dollar, 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 dollar. The dollar. Oh, I'll just sing it. You have to sing it. Right? I, 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 I actually think I'm going to write that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops, I got too many dollars. <laughs> <laughs> That's ridiculous. A darling chorus. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll have a go at the first one. Well, actually, you're such a you're such you a clever man. Yeah, you know that. Oh, that's so yeah, you would, yeah, and you and you would know the words. You would no, know the words. No, you channel them. Actually, I'm not sure. Okay, this uh, this was this song was uh, uh, what they call at the at the time of the new year. Poor people uh, went round with lanterns and 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 uh, songs in the cold in England, and they begged the rich people to give them something. Right? It was a new year celebration thing. Very sad in some respects because those people were so poor, and it, it showed you know how rich people dealt with poor people in, in unenlightened times. Mm. And the the, uh, the the wassail apparently was a gift that they would bring in their poverty to try to get a shilling or a coin. Mm. 
for, you know, to try to, to try to get some kindness to survive. And so it starts off. Um, Go wassail, oh wassail, throughout the town. Our cup it is white and the isle it is brown. Our wassail is made from a good island cake. Come nutmeg and ginger, the best we could pay. Oh the dal, the dal, the dal, the dal, the dal, the dal, the day. All the darrow, all the dairy, sing to rely o Our wassail is made of the elderberry bough, and so my good neighbour will drink unto thou. And where you have one barrel, we hope you have ten, so that we may have cider when we call again. <laughs> There's a master and a mistress sitting down by the fire while we poor wassail boys stand here in the mire. Come, you pretty maid, with a silver head at pen, pray open the door and let us come in. Oh, the doll, 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 Oh, the doll, 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 the the doll, the the doll, the doll, the doll, the the doll, the the doll, the doll, the doll, the and we know by the star that we are not too far, and we know by the ground that we are within sound. Oh, the doll, the doll, the doll, the doll, the doll, the doll, the dee. Oh, the dare, oh, the dare, sing to rely, oh. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you. Wow. Ah, the kookaburras have fallen out of a tree. <laughs> All right, and on, um, thank you very much, Paul. Yeah. Um, and don't forget, like, I've been making some mung bean dal up here. Yeah. yeah. Well, hey, Bronwyn, how do you, what's my dal like? How was it? Oh, sumptuous. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. The best dal in all of Gora, probably the only dal we've in Gora. Um, we had but, uh, and today. And so. mm. All right, and um, then uh, I'll invite Gabriel Dunleavy up. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Um, I can't get here every Wednesday, so I'm, I'm going to plan to get here every alternate Wednesday. And um, bring a note, Gabriel. Mm -hmm. hey? Bring a note. Oh, yeah. <laughs> high note. Um, high, high note. Very high note. Um, I was looking for tonight for what used to be my fav one of my favourite Russian poems by the composer Masorgsky. And um, I used to have it on Penguin Dual Language um, Poetry. Um, it was out of print. And I lost my copy a long time ago. So it was on the internet, it was on Google. And I eventually found uh, one that was in French and Russian. But the Russian was Tsarist Russian, and that had about five different letters that are in there. That's so I translated from the French, and I thought, why do I think, why don't I think this was any good? <laughs> and meantime, I'd uh, looked on eBay for uh, Russian English dual language books, and I found one that. Uh, that um, been uh, published in the Soviet Union in 1982, and somebody was selling it on eBay from the Ukraine, 
Um, and they got that and they had a flip through that when it arrived two days ago. And there are some very good things in there, so I'm going to uh, do one at a, a time for maybe three or four times in succession. Um, and uh, I'll do one tonight, and then I'll do uh, one of my own, which I'm also going to have to introduce. Um, and I'll, because Russian is such a beautiful language to hear, um, I'll do the first three lines of Russian, then I'll do the translation. The translation uh, is good, but the, it, it's made to rhyme instead of just translate, so it's a bit cheesy in the rhyme. Mm. And then at the end, which isn't that long, I'll uh, do the last lines in Russian as well. Okay. <clears throat> so, the English uh, title of this one, written in 1955 by the way, is The Ugly Little Girl, or now for the Russian, Nekrasivaya Divochka. Sredi Dugish Igrashuya Stjeche Ana Napom Nyayat Yayushuka. Zapravlenia Vatrusi Hudaya Rubashunta. Kalechki Vijavatia Kudro. Now, the whole thing in English. The sparse, untidy ginger head curls, in meagre wisps about her head lie scattered. The blouse she wears is faded, old and tattered. She looks a freak among the boys and girls playing around her. Poor misshapen creature with crooked teeth and sharp and gainly features. Not too far away, two handsome little lads enjoy the bicycles just bought them by their dads. They ride about with happy turns and twists, while she runs after happy as the boys. Though they are scarce aware that she exists, her heart is filled with other children's joys. She laughs, their thoughtlessness forgiving, an ugly little urchin with a shrill voice in raptures at the sheer delight of living. No shade of spite, not one malicious notion, has ever found its way into her head. All in the world arouses her emotion, all is alive to her which some of us think dead. And as I watch, I try to quench the fear that there must come a day, perhaps quite near, when all her ugliness, the child will come to know, and life for her will be deprived of joy. I dread to think the heart is just a toy that can be broken by a single blow. I still would hope that the unblemished beacon which shines within her with such brilliant light will overcome the pain and burn as bright, will brave the worst of storms and never weaken. Perhaps there is no beauty in her face to captivate a man's imagination, and yet she shows a spiritual grace that fills each step of hers with animation. If she be ugly, what is beauty then? Why is it worshipped everywhere by men? Is all its value in the outward form or is it something hidden, live and warm? Now the last lines in Russian. А если это так, то что есть красота? И почему ее обещают люди? Со суд она, в котором сустота или огон, мертвающий в сосуде. so-called academic, and I've been a so-called academic uh, since 1975, um, and I've uh, observed universities get more and more, com what they call commodified, um, business orientated, blah, blah, blah. Um, and uh, a lot of my uh, colleagues, particularly colleagues in the union, uh, lament the loss of academic freedom. But I have a theory 
But the way you get academic freedom these days is by relying on management solipsism, navel gazing, and absolute disinterest in anything you may be doing. Mm. So mm. when I started off at UNE, and um, about two years into it, I, I realised what I was in. Um, I started a sort of democracy wall outside my office, and uh, I put more and more provocative stuff, uh, oh. Oh. Like, like a picture of Mao celebrating his uh, anniversary at the height of the Cultural Revolution, for example. Um, nobody here thought, ah, oh, this is too easy. So I wrote a, I wrote a poem. Um, and uh, I thought, now, I, I could get fired for this one, so I'll cover myself, and uh, I sent it to the, the atheist magazine called The Rationalist. Um, it's a nice magazine, so you often got some very good articles in it. But, now, they published that, I, don't, I didn't know if they would or not, then when uh, management comes to me and says, misconduct, I say, that's a rationalist, I would say, it's a... It's as good as a refereed article, this. <laughs> but I must warn you, there is the C word in it. So when I get to that... Cacophony? Yeah, that, not exactly. When I get to that, I will not say anything for a second. And if, if you want to shout out the word, then um, I think that would be very nice. In, in yeah. So... Bring it on. And um, oh. another ref uh, two references I need to give you. The first line is from a, a, a hit by Brenda Lee in 1962 called Dum Dum. And uh, near, near the end of the uh, poem uh, is a quotation, well, not a quotation, but um, in uh, Hebrew Kabbalah Jewish tradition, um, the central sphere of the ten is called Tiferet, and the aspect of God that is there in English is called God made manifested knowledge. And the Hebrew for that is Allah Wadat. I need to tell you that, otherwise you wouldn't know what the hell's coming at that point in the poem. Right, here we go. This, called, this is called knowledge. I'm not going to sing the first line. <clears throat> um, not till I know you better. Dumb, dumb, a down we go dumb. Sings the master in her college. She surfs the web with languid thumb, accumulating knowledge. The student prince dreams thirstily of a panacea. Good. <laughs> questioning accursedly the end point of his hunt. Allo, allo, allo of a dart, God manifested knowledge. The horse remains behind the cart at Dr. Johnson's college. I'm just a uh, mental midget, the my mental giants here. Yeah. <laughs> salty. Giant, don't put yourself there. That salty, silent word that you just said yeah. apparently has another meaning, or a neutral mm. meaning, which was a lowly paid clerk that wrote on paper. Mm. Okay. A clerk yeah. had that name and title in ancient times. So How did it transition? Then? How did it transition? Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm not sure, but that you could be known as that and in the same way as in America they have a tradition where a colonel can be an auctioneer. So there is disfigurement in understanding. In, 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 in America, you can call yourself a colonel if you're an auctioneer. We can't do it here. Mm. All right, moving right along. Just with me here, I've got um, this here is a Campbell Laurel chopping board available here from the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame, come down all the way from Queensland, made by my son Luca and his uncle Matt. Very nice. Um, so, yeah, these are from Campbell Laurel, which is a noxious weed in well northern New South Wales and southeast Queensland. Um, so, yeah, they're being harvested to take the you know, the noxious weed out 
and um, and you know, allow, don't like it, it, allow the high, well the bugs don't like it, the bacteria don't doesn't like it. like it, and it smells delicious. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it does. Mm. <coughs> so pass it around, and you can all have a yeah. smell and clear your sinuses <laughs> on the way. Mm. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, so antibacterial, oh, sustainably lovely. harvested We're from fresh. a noxious weed like and available here yeah. when they're used in your kitchen. <laughs> a bit of worn khaki and other poems by Fred P. Morris published in, well actually this one's even older, 19, about 1915 because it says in the front to dear Aunt Bella and from May and Rob, wishing you all the joy of the season, Christmas 1917. Mm -hmm. So this was, um, yeah, during <coughs> World War One. Mm -hmm. This one's called Even Tide. It's only one page, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's quite short. I battled hard through life's long day to shape my course, to carve away. But at night, with my face to the golden west and deep in my heart, a strange, sweet rest, I said, it is well, God's way is best. God's way is best. Mm. Can you read that again? Yeah, it's short. Yeah, it's it's short. Sweet, isn't it? Mm. The sense of sweet. I, um, yeah, and I'll probably fix up the bit where I got my words a bit twisted there. Yeah. I battled hard through life's long day to shape my course, to carve my way. But at night, with my face to the golden west and deep in my heart, a strange, sweet rest, I said it is well. God's way is best. God's way is best. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, another really quick one. It's quite trained, so four, four lines. Pretty sure. Yeah. My lovely rose. Tis born again with every spring. A sacred, sweet, eternal thing. A thought of God that dies to rise and ever rising never dies. Mm -hmm. My lovely, my lovely rose by Fred P. Morris, and I'll take the opportunity to invite Ali Cairns on up. Mm -hmm. And she'll be doing it from over the side because she doesn't want to be on camera, so that's all good. <laughs> <coughs> all right, all right, this is Arlo. Ali, like a... <laughs> stop thinking! <laughs> you missed stuff! <laughs> you won't get it, but I did. I've got to kick up the fight. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> If lives were on in humanity, the world would cease to be. If lights were on in humanity, all life on earth would be seen. If lights were on in humanity, then let them shine upon the land and let all life on earth be seen. Please, please, please. Mm. If life on earth was seen at all, humanity would not need a mind creating a world without life on earth around them. If life on earth could show us the way, can we be led? by life on earth. Be present. Stop thinking. Look around you and view an astounding world called nature calling out to you. Calling out 
to you, mm. calling out to you. Mm. Well, thank you very much, Ali. Appreciate it. Um, William Heiner, this book here was published in um, 1970. Did you get all these over at Urella? Yeah. <laughs> um, William Heiner was born in Cape Town, South Africa in 1926. Um, but in spite of his age, so that was 19, this was 1970, he was a younger Australian poet. Um, and since uh, 1966, his work appeared frequently in Australian literature. And this was up until... 1970 when this book was published, it was only a dollar back then. Um, I paid three dollars for it, so it's actually appreciated in value. Um, and I like that bookshop there in Urella, it's not that overly expensive either. Great, yeah, I've been going there for about 35 years. Mm. So, this is um, the, the title poem of the book. William Street by William Heiner, Wilhelm Heiner. And um, just a bit of background information. Uh, William Street is the road that leads to King's Cross in Sydney. Mm -hmm. And at night, particularly, the street can be seen to form the upright of a cross outlined in lights and sometimes <coughs> from a certain height. Shadows <coughs> suggest the hunched shape <coughs> of a crucified man. <coughs> Kenneth Slesser yeah. has entered the room. <coughs> William Street. <coughs> At the Babel restaurant, the lone waitress is dilatory. She ignores me leaning against the wall, picking her navel. I pause pendant in Babel on the third floor until I can rise to eternity. Now the goods are delivered, my client avoids me, delaying payment. I watch through wide windows, eagling insects that scramble eagerly on the road. Some wriggle, nailed on headlamps, their pen-drawn legs squiggling on the upright. Microscopic on the slide, I detect his face, Semitic, among the, among the insect horde. And I lean from the window, sour <laughs> with sweat and anxious for my payment. With sudden urgency, Joe, I call Joe, and hear my voice in reversal. Unit by hysteria, the client turns slowly, his hands whole with emptiness. Don't see me now, he mouths and shrugs like the carpet seller who tricked me in Cairo. I've not come, not yet, I'll be back. Rage grows, <coughs> god damn it, I know. I've been swindled again. Jew, I wail, Jew, pay the bloody price. Well, give me back my soul. He shrugs again and turns and walks towards the cross. I rage at the window. Jesus Christ, I crow, you goddamn bloody swindler. <laughs> Now, um, after I, um, I'm going to invite Doug up in a moment. Um, actually, no, I was going to invite Steve up next, if that's all right. Yeah, sure. Something to do? Sure, yeah. Sure. I um, spent far too much time in that street being <laughs> naughty. Yeah. 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 He's crossing. William Street. <laughs> <clears throat> but I, I had a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, Nine Miles from Gundagai is the name of the book by um, Jack Moses. Um, not 
too sure if they're all his, but like, I think it's more a compilation by Jack Moses, because they're not all his. Um, first one I'm going to do tonight is keep the billy boiling. We've cracked our jokes and had our fun and done our share of toiling. We hope those mates who follow on will keep the billy boiling. <laughs> Um, now, the following two, um, I guess, are a little bit close to my heart, probably Ashley's too, because um, Ashley grew up there in the Northern Rivers. The first one I'm going to do is Mullum, about Mullum Bimbi. Um, I'm going back to Mullum. To Mullumbimby I must go, to Chinkagan and the cattle where the Brunswick's waters flow. To the mountain range and valley to where the mellow thrushes sing, oh what memories of mateship, oh what merry thoughts they bring. Oh those happy days of boyhood when we splashed in the silvery pool with the kookaburras laughing among the gum trees round the school. I'm going back to Mullum and now I needs must hurry so somebody is waiting for me beside the slip rails lying low. <laughs> I must hasten, I must hurry, for there the sweetest girl in life keeps a vigil while I'm coming, she who's to be my Aussie wife. If God gives us little kiddies, I all will go to our good old school and they will dive just as we did into the shady swimming pool. And they'll love those hills and valleys where we can work and till and sow down by dear old Mullumbimby where the Brunswick's waters flow. Right up and up at Maynard. Oh, we'll yeah. go there someday. Up you and I will make a movie of it. Biggest little up thing. Up uh, <laughs> the Devil's Hole. It's quite something, actually. Unicorn Hole up there. It, it's a yeah. last waterfall and set falls. of swimming pools. Yeah, yeah. 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 into oh, Unicorn yeah. Hole. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's a last set of pools yeah. and a little waterfall that tips and pops over into the Yukai. Mm. Oh. It's quite something. You're still in Upper Maynard. But it's that line where the waterfall, you've been there, yeah. pops over. It's got this inimitable charm. Mm. I came to go there a year ago. <laughs> you were there a year ago? Yeah, a year ago. Bugger me. <laughs> it's magic. So crazy. the following one is called Nimbin. But it was written well before 1973 when Nimbin all changed. <laughs> Mm. Um, due to the Aquarius Festival and the mm. arrival of the, the mass arrival of the students in the alternative or progressive lifestyles that moved there. Mm. Uh, this is quite an old poem. Um, Nimbin. I was there at that festival. Me too. I'm one of the ones who made it. You're not in any brother. Were you there too? Yeah. Two, three. <laughs> Bloody hell, three. Sorry about that. Well, oh, I'm morning. glad you're not all running around <laughs> naked now. That would be horrible. Oh. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting that three of us were there. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The unholy. So if you get your clothes yeah. off when you recognise each other, or what? Now he's changed. <laughs> no, no, okay. Yeah. What a funny coincidence. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anybody take any photos? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> Nimbin, I can't forget you, Nimbin. You charm me like a book. The cattle in your valley, the mountain and the brook. The wet bird in the ranges awakening his mate. The basalt columns standing like pickets at your gate. You've... Dowry and your beauty, your wealth and yet untold in the orchard and the timber and the streams that carry gold. You've an asset in the babies of the soldier who's come back, the children of the pioneer who blazed the Nimbin track. You were nothing but a wilderness just a little while ago. You're a town of some importance now. It's grand to see you grow. Well, I'd like to toast you, Nimbin. Now I'm on the job, God keep your waters going that are flowing from the knob. <laughs> and the knob refers to the uh, blue knob. Mm -hmm. Alright, um, and on that, Steve, words.
Smith, come on, boys. Come on up. Good day, James. Hey, welcome. Hey, welcome. It's always good to be here at the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame. Wednesday night, nearly lost it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, a, an eye-opener to be here, and I thank James for setting this place up because it gives us the opportunity to be able to voice our opinions. And that He's is all that's off already. Stripping off already. Yeah, You're not right. in Nimbin now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting, the Nimbin situation, you know. A number of uh, elders of the of the Rainbow Tribes and all that turned up to meet the uh, custodians of the land at that time and the, and the elders of the tribe all turned up naked and the, and, and the indigenous were all in suits. <laughs> that was really interesting, yeah. Yeah, it was, um, I, I have a few poems and I was going to find some out there about the Nimbin before the Aquarius situation because I was there too, yeah, I was actually playing drums on stage at the at the uh, Aquarius Festival and such, at way back, and it was, uh, yeah, a wonderful time. I've had many opportunities to be in places and tell poetry of all kinds and such, and, uh, yeah, some of the poems that I tell are, are deep and meaningful, and some of them are a bit humorous and such, and people say, where does a place a bloke like me come from? Well, I was brought up in the country in a place called Wedderburn, on the side of the Georges River with the stags and the elks and the ferns. There wasn't many luxuries, no, things weren't very plush, but we had this long drop dummy called the orifice of the bush. There's one thing that I know for sure, and I spent a lot of time just doodling in the dirt there, and I even wrote some rhyme. A place to fantasise and figure out, but everything was true. I hide out from the washing up like young lads often do. I'd always lift the lid up to avoid a bit of fright, to eradicate the chances of the dreaded red back bite. Like mum's old chook, I'd settle them with me pants around me knees to the sound of the neighbour's rampant ball and fruit bats in the trees. Like a medieval king, I'd sit upon his gilded throne, my favourite place, I must admit, in our lovely country home. Yes, I'm a connoisseur of dunnies. Of this it is a fact. A place to try, a place to check before I hang my hat. I remember when I left the bush in a council house in town, there was an outhouse out the back. Yeah, a place to settle down. It wasn't quiet as our country home, but it had all the mods and cons. Run and water, electric light, and an oven to cook scones. I'd only been there a week, I think, when I awoke with an awful fright. There was a shadow past the window in the middle of the night. I'd heard about these prowlers and their low-down thieving tricks, but they'd taken on the wrong bloke this time, this lad from out the sticks. Well, I hit the floor running. There wasn't time to put on clothes. I'll get that flaming larrikin and I'll probably break his nose. Through the front door quietly, the blood was pumping fast. I'd stop him at the gate, I think, thought, as the bare feet hit the grass. He was running up the footpath with his booty on his back. I'd played rugby in my school days and I'd stop him in his track. Well, I hit him round the ankles and he had nowhere to go. Yeah, I dropped him like a dunny lid and all he said was, No! The smell was something awful. I'd never live it down. I'd nailed the poor old dunny man and I'd dropped him on the ground. There was excretion all across the grass and right across the road. The lid had left the dunny can and he dropped the flame and load. Well, throughout my years of wandering, I think I've tried the lot. There's the environmental sound ones, there's flush laboratories and there's pots. There's collectors of pubs and pins, of bottle stamps and plants. But I'm the international, no, universal secretary of the place you drop your pants. I've tested loos across this land and I've tried the loos abroad. There's the ones you pull the chain on, there's authentic ones, and there's frauds, but there's nothing in comparison when you have to strain and push as a good old Aussie dunny and the orifice of the bush. Very <laughs> 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 
Yeah. On that note, just on that note, 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 has, has <laughs> and then Larry told me this, a bunch of dunny lanes. Oh, wow. So there's these, these big long streets, and, yep. and the houses are back to back, to, but there's a big lane down the middle of them, wow. where the dunny man used to go and collect the cans. Yeah, yeah. 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 okay, it's good. Yeah, well, I was um, travelling in through the West uh, a couple of years ago. We don't get to travel as much as we used to for some reason. But I was travelling across the Gibb River and I was there the other, uh, you know, it would be five years ago now. And I'm coming across and, and me and this lovely Canadian lady that was travelling with me. And we, we went into this outback place and there's all these toilets in these wonderful places through the Territory and such. And we rocked into this place and the toilet was atrocious, absolutely atrocious. So we pulled the car a little bit further away from the toilet and, and uh, went to bed for the night and all that. Seven o'clock in the morning, there's the outback to uh, plumbers. And I thought, wow, look at that. These guys out there fixing that up, you know. And when I got into the territory, one of my mates is a plumber, an apprentice plumber there. And, and I uh, met him up in Darwin and he, Gave me a, a you know a good time. We went fishing the harbour of, of Darwin and such. But uh, he was telling me some of the tales, and I wrote this: "The Heroes of the West." We hear the tales of heroes and people that fight wars, but the ones that I have travelled that are the heroes and the best, the rugged outback plumbers. Yes, the plumbers of the West. <laughs> They're the real heroes. They take on all the toil. They fight the biggest battles while digging in the soil and have the biggest challenges and fight the biggest wars. They take on every challenge and keep the place afloat. Whenever anything goes wrong, they're in it no matter what, how much it stings, smells, or how much it's bloody rot. They are there with tools in hand, no matter what it costs. They're out there in the thick of it, to unblock them stinking drains, no matter what is thrown at them in sunshine or in pouring rain. There's slimy flowing sewerage there enough to their chest. When the dunny's blocked, you'll call them, they're on their way. Yes, them Aussies, outback plumbers, they're the heroes of the West. <laughs> the difference that makes us not a third world country, it's not the politicians who think their shit don't stink, or how much that we make or earn, or how much we can drink. It's not how tough our soldiers are, or planes and tanks and ships. It's our flaming drainage system and the ones that put it in. Them Aussie outback plumbers, yes, the heroes of the West. You think that I'm joking? Next time you have a crack, or you shelter from the rain, have a wash, or turn on the tap. Think of the ones that put the pipes in, or fix the leak in drains. Let them pay all some, let's pay them all some homage and give them recognition for what they have accomplished. Take our hats off to the plumbers. Yes, the heroes of the West. Mm -hmm. I, um, I, I loved Gladys's poem, the, the Spirit of the Bush, and I, um, a few weeks earlier, had put something together, and it's called The Spirit of Australia. There is magic in the mountains with the Aussie sounds around us as we travel through the universe and we thrive here in nature <laughs> as Mother Earth supplies. With the waters from the mountain springs and the sounds of birds as they sing and a gentle breeze just whispering a lovely lullaby. When the fire burns around us and the forests are ablaze and the smoke is so thick and you can't see through the haze and the anguish of the hurt and the loss of the affected in its path. Through many trials and hardships throughout this southern land as the devastation spreads and the virus comes to bear. There is a time of gathering while the crew are slowly mustering and the instruments are tuned up to make that special vibe. Yes, the magnetism is magic, not bound by the illusion and the outside world's confusion as we open up our eyes. Yes, we open up our real eyes and we realise the real eyes to the truth that has been found. So we live here in abundance with the Aussie sounds around us, with the orchestra of nature, 
and we find our place <clears throat> in the symphony. <clears throat> Tried by virus, fire and floods and hardship and the spirit of this southern land really comes alive. <clears throat> Yes, when fires of inspiration are ignited and the poetic words start to flow like the rapids in the mountains and the imagination grows. Don't damn the flow of magic. Be inspired by every word. Let us use the words we are given to instigate the change of logic that is needed in these times and voice the inspiration from our inner higher self and realise our real eyes and know that we have got this. Be inspired by every word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've got to aim this at James a little bit, you know. They worry me, these poets who talk about wallabies and native rats. What about these feral animals, foxes, toads and cats? They are just as relevant with all their nasty ways Camels, cows and donkeys and even goats and sheep. We've introduced and brought on board all these foreign thieves that have stolen all the flora, that fed all the natives and the bees. Like the spread of the colonies that stole this southern land from they that lived in harmony and wandered throughout this land. I've got one there that I, Saul has challenged me over the last period of time and, and um, I stand in the place of the romantic poet and uh, Saul has been coming out with all these romance words and these love stories and that and, and I've been challenged a little bit so if this challenges every now and then I'll, I'll do it. It's never been done before. <laughs> planting seeds in the garden of the mind. I'm the maker of magic and the weaver of dreams, so don't think that you're alone, I'm deep within you. In the early morning as the sun comes shining through, I will touch your silken body with my magic fingers true, ploughing furrows in the garden of your mind, planting seeds of orgasmic bliss in the deep subconscious mind, I will kiss the nape of your long and slender neck and run the tip of my tongue down your full and lovely spine. As you move and squirm for my loving touch, as your lower body arches and your wetness starts to flow. And your dreams are full of love and your mind goes into overdrive as I touch those inner places, those vibrations that I am sending, will make you come again, so kiss me, babe, as I sow in the garden of your mind. So feel your mystic lover as I tickle all your bits. Let's have a lot of fun. So come on, let me bite you on your naked bum and make you, give, and make you giggle. <laughs> let me tweak your sexy nipples as you ooh and tell me lower. Can I make you squeal as we have some light-hearted fun? I really want to play some silly little games, whispering sweet nothings. Ha ha, you weren't expecting that. Yes, playing in the clouds of love, we are both running naked through the gardens of your mind. I'm the hummingbird with its long and powerful beak, deep, deep penetration into the blossoms and the lotus flowers, sucking that awesome flower flowing honey. As the petals start to spread so wide, the fragrance and the aroma as it is exposed, all that is inside, efficacy in the pollination as I plant the seeds of love in the garden of your mind. Oh. <laughs> Thank you for inspiring me there. <laughs> Clouds of love, shrouds of sharp. Nice. Uh, we, we, as poets, we write some interesting things and, and some of them are challenging and some of them are, are deep and meaningful. I, I got uh, landed in Tweed Hospital. <laughs> I got landed in Tweed Hospital not too long ago and I was, I was hit by a tick and I was there for two weeks and I couldn't understand really why I was there for that length of time. 
Anyway, oh, you made a diet, did you? Uh, no, I didn't actually. No, I was you very were, well actually. And you were in hospital. For I was two in weeks. hospital for two weeks, but then an elder came into the bed opposite me, and I got to spend the last four hours of his life with him, and uh, I was actually yeah, doing a naughty thing with him. We sat on the tweed and had a bit of a tote and, and uh, settled over each other and talked about the meanings of, of life. I had the great privilege to meet this man, a man of spirit and a man of colour, born and bred in the Pilliga scrub, inspiration to the human race. Ex-politician, alcohol and drug abuse counsellor, a visionary who could speak into the hearts of men, the family somewhere in the past intervened by a clever man, affecting the very future of his mob. Cultural, spiritual, walking into the dreaming. Eyes open, not being blindsided to the deception that manipulate and destroy society. A lover of his family, a lover of his people, a lover of this great land that we call home, a very good friend and a great Australian. His totem of bull ant, his father of kangaroo, his grandfather, the witchy grub. He has four children, two boys and two girls. He leaves a wonderful footprint that will span the generations. I will walk with him in the dreaming. We have many journeys to walk, my brother. Stand strong. I see you on the ridge in the sunset. Flowing hair, spear and boomerang in hand, a warrior looking deep into the future. Walk proud and strong, my brother. Yeah, I, I've had a, a number of visits to the Northern Territory. Back in the, the 75, I um, was there. I opened my first business in Alice in, in 75. And then I returned about um, oh, five years ago, but I came in from the west side. And as I hit the western side of the Northern Territory, all the memories of 40 years from before flooded back to me. It's interesting how that happens, you know, you, they leave your mind, you come back into a, a place and they just flood into your mind again. And I travelled down and I um, went to the Three Ways Roadhouse because in the 70s I ended up as night barman and cook at the Three Ways Roadhouse, which is called, the, oh, I've referred to as the Three Ways Bloodhouse at that time. The Three Ways Roadhouse was a legend. It's not the way that it was. You'd struggle weeks just to get there, digging out your trucks out of the bog. From Winton to Cloncurry was awful, or going down the Bullier Track. You'd travel all night across the Barclay, and when you reached the Three Ways Roadhouse, you had made it. You were really, yes, really out back. This place was a place of decision. Which bloody way would you go? You could go to the top, or down to the rock, or turn around and make your way home. It had a name as the Three Ways Bloodhouse, known for fighting and fear. When the deluge came down the Barclay and the road to Isaac was sneered. The truckers would line up by the dozens at the Three Ways Roadhouse pub. They would drink till they dropped with no limit, then wake up for a feed and some broth. Well, it was fine here in the three ways, but the roads were all cut by rains. You could venture down to the Alice, but below it would drive you insane. 1,400 miles of bull dust and con corrugations. It would bugger up all of your truck, blowing tire after tire, mile after mile, staying at the three ways was the best. Who gave a fuck? When the beer ran out at the Three Ways Roadhouse, they brought up a truck from the south. Sixteen tyres it blew on the south road. Surrey was a horrible brew, but it made up most of the load. All of the beer cartons were battered and beaten. There was no writing on any of the cans. We unloaded thousands of cartons, but the worst of all, no doubt, all the cartons weighed nothing. They were empty and all the beer had run out. We ran out of tucker to feed all the truckers, so a trip to Banker Banker was made. A steer was then killed, brought back in a ute, and all the freezers were filled. Smitty carved it all nice, it was laid out on ice, 
we're looking grand and bloody great barbecue was planned. The barman and cook's job was to feed this old mob, a bloody great barbie was had and all went good without too much beer but with plenty of cheer. Then the Barclay came open after three months, no joking, and all of the truckers disappeared. Three ways roadhouse, you're a bloody mm -hmm. legend. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, I'm, I'm sort of, I, I got this long and, hey, we've lived a long life, and I have many children, which I love them all. And every now and then you have to write a story. Lost but not forgotten, my first love. I've lived my life without you, not allowed to be your dad. The lies that were told you, I was made out to be a cat. <clears throat> the hurt that this has caused you has torn my very soul. Truth, the truth that was never told you has left me with this hole. A childhood bent and twisted, this cannot be denied. The many times I've struggled by love that was denied. All I ever wanted was to hold you, yes, embrace you in my arms, show you love and kisses, the lover of a father's charms. I've watched you struggle, though you've bloomed without doubt. You've grown and survived this trauma and become the best about. The many times I've bragged about your achievements, though I've never been a part, this daughter that I've never had, this love that was denied me has broke my loving heart. One day I hope that you will see me as you really am, as I really am, the lovely, loving, caring person who has survived the life of pain. <coughs> I love the love of my life that was stolen, love thrown in the drain. I'm not the one you think I am, fucked up by bloody lies and shame. My grandchildren are so beautiful, not that I should know, I'm just that bloody shadow that was thrown out in the cold. Another fabulous generation that I cannot be part. Blood runs deep in their veins one day, I hope they'll know of me, the battler, hurt but a survivor that has a bloody go. Mm. Wow. Thank you. Poetry as we, you know, one of the things that poems do and poets do is write down their thoughts and that is what poetry is mm. and sometimes it is deep and really uh, challenging to ourselves but when we voice it it's necessary for us to put them words into motion mm. and I like to have a go at the, the, the grey nomads the grey nomads are <coughs> wonderful people I mean the older people who <coughs> travel this land right? And uh, when I travelled over from Perth, I think I must have seen 10,000 caravans and RVs. Caravans and RVs by the thousand. I've travelled in vessels and boats of all kind. If you don't keep your eye on all of the signs, if you put too much weight at the top, there's no doubt. If you don't flip around, up, the rivets come out. <coughs> I think that old Aussie is going to capsize as the grand bloody exodus moving around. If we don't capsize her, we'll break it in half as the population moves from the north to the south. There's thousands of nomads who move up and down with the best CVs that money can buy. It's new status. Who can get the best rig? When it comes to it, who gives a free? We've mined so much steel from under the ground, thousands of tons just moving around. As we've mined and fracked it and knocked it about, I think Mother Nature will kick us all out. <laughs> well, you know, I went over, over to uh, Perth to, to meet up with my old mate over there. He's a bit of a character. He's a bloody old hit man, you know, like he, he was an armour guard and he used to carry his gun round in his, and we used to call him Dick Tracy, but he's, he's been a solid mate for a long time. I'll tell you a tale of a good friend of mine, a hard hitting turd of a man. Yes, old Bob would fight at the drop of a hat without any reason or plan. Well, this is the truth of old Greenie, a man that was always in strife. When he rolled up his fist to take to a man, it was like taking thunder to fight. Well, we've been in many a scuffle, 
and we've been in many a fight, but the only time in my memory that he didn't come up looking fine was when Jenny, his good wife, blew out his lights by hitting him in the head with the iron. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my, my name's Steve Wordsmith. My book is Where the Rubber Hits the Road in this game they call life. It's available here at the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame and it's also in 2,500 bookshops across the world. And with all your prayers, my next book will be on the market soon. Have a great time. Steve. And um, yeah, just, uh, I don't know, my, you don't have to be a panda poem was a bit prophetic. Remember the last two lines? Poets write of love and also sometimes turds. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's welcome to Wednesday words. <laughs> um, so, well, why not have a bit of toilet humour, <laughs> hey? Um, this, this was something I wrote 12 months ago. <laughs> it's a dialogue. Do you have a bathroom? No, but we've got a toilet. Great, where is it? But I'm sorry, you can't bath in the toilet. Do you have a restroom? No, but we have a toilet. Would you like a pillow and blanket? Because it's not too comfortable resting on the toilet. Can I use the toilet? I don't know, did your mother toilet train you? <laughs> um, most, most languages use the word toilet. Toilet. Russian and all sorts they use it. Oh, they use yeah. the word toilet. <laughs> all right. We've got a couple more to go. Um, Doug, now, um, this was uh, written out in the street a couple of days ago by myself. It's called The Watcher. In the street sits the Watcher. Not going anywhere. Sips his coffee and stares. High visibility vested tradies in vans travelling to job sites, drinks, energy boosts in cans. The watcher is watching the world going around and a line of ants walking on the ground. One trudging, begrudging, step by step they go, many hurried and late, others slow. Monday, sun rises steadily to travel the sky, while unemployed flocks of colourful birds dart, sing, fly. The watcher just sits and silently observes the patterns of existence and writes it down in words. And on that note, I'll invite Doug up. Come on up, Doug. Welcome. Thank you. Pretty hard acts to follow here. Bloody hard acts to follow. Thank you. Oh, get over here. I'm just going to say, so I can't think of the name. Gabriel. Gabriel. And yeah, I want to thank you, mate, for your Russian content and your comment about the academia. I'm related to a lot of them. Yeah. And they tried to exercise the magic out of me, so they haven't totally succeeded. <laughs> thank you. A bit bad. <laughs> Uh, okay, I actually, James, what I have to go the sound. Hmm? I got a question. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so this is called What Truth? And I, like, I was touched a bit by a couple of your offerings. Thank you. Steve, especially about kids who don't know you. Thank you. Yeah, me too. Mm. Join the club. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but bless them. And yeah, I don't know about the love one day. I hope, I believe. Okay, <clears throat> this is called What Truth? The truth will set you free! Exclamation mark. Truth. Truth is in the verse, you see? I yearn and scrounge for truth all day. I wake and sleep and dream and pray, I eat and drink, I think away. 
<clears throat> I'm drawn towards, I'm pushed right back. The winds can blow me somewhere true and back to somewhere other. Thinking of William Street. I got out of William Street before I died. <clears throat> God bless. I drink my booze, pontificate, and tell you absolutes. I've now been changed a while. My glass is new. <clears throat> no longer is this my right to, well, I didn't got a good line here, but no longer is this my right to just harass to you. With my view. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, if gentle is the strongest force, how can this tame my views? <clears throat> this force may steer me to the road that only I can walk. You're trailing down a different path. You say you don't agree. Too long I've listened every place except inside of me. My mind is, my mind is open now, they say. Surprise is not surprising. <clears throat> to be or not to be is floated. To know or not to know, maybe. To feel or not to feel is right or wrong, a steel strong door. Does in between give answers? Two. Can I watch for both sides now and glimpse of this potential? I'm nearly done. <laughs> <clears throat> not quite. <clears throat> to not critique you, not to judge, seems much beyond my power. <clears throat> the sucking mandates round me now, the penalties abound. And I'm the black sheep of a mob, conformity is called for. The herd requirement does not fit my truth. My truth is all that matters. Australia Day said one and three. It's just no fun, the one may want. The voice of choice is down the drain. It's hard to be minority. Mandates from the halls of power are starting to turn sour. Mm. Help I need to hold my truth, with which most don't concur. The voice inside me nudges strong. Those shackles can't and don't belong. Neither does the shackles vibe. V I B E. Amen. Thank you very much. The camera. Mm -hmm. uh, mate, I, I've got a poem, I don't know how much time you've got. I've got a poem I've worked for a good friend's mother about a horse and got, they couldn't be broken. I have a photo here where she's, she had a friend with dingoes. She's, mm -hmm. she's in the nursing home. Yep, it's two pages, too long. No, no. Do you want to do it? Yes, please, yeah. Well, I've got a photo I'd like to pass it. Pat Winter Irving, the family's got a lot of country around here. Uh, and Pat's in the nursing home in Arnold. I just passed you pass it, mate. Uh, she wrote this poem in 1969. I think she was living up at Craner up North Rockwell. <clears throat> it's a very touching poem, and if you stay with it, I haven't read it out loud before, but it might bring a tear to your eyes if you, if you love horses, or you love the idea of a horse's happiness. Okay, I'll have a go at it anyway. Pat Winter Irving, 1969 at Yakamunda which is Rockwell somewhere. <clears throat> he was a chestnut colt, grown tall, strong and sinewy. Head held high, proud and free. Good breeding style was he. Free he'd been since branding age. His home a wilderness of space. One day, through lack of water forced, he left his large domain. His telltale marks were was seen, the gateways closed behind him, and his freest days were over. Mm. Among the station stock he mixed, a try was made to break him. Unknown was his wildness, unknown was his fear, unknown was his past. He whirled around the large yards, 
his very hooves took flight. He vaulted o'er the high rail fence in search of freedom dear. Someone placed him in the crush. He tore, he kicked, he broke the rails. His hocks were hurt, his spirit gained, his fear intense and grave. But when his freedom came again, his mind began to think. <clears throat> the next time in the yard, he let himself be caught. He feared the man, but stood his ground <coughs> and found he was not hurt. Let out again, he melted now amongst the mob he ran with. And in again from time to time, he wondered at the rails to the gates. A year or more, a year or more passed swiftly by, a time that ogre, beast itself, decided now the hour. He watched all week, his mates so close, were geared, were bagged, were ridden. The time had come to try him out. Some clout went in, equipped with rod and gear. There was no need to rope him. He held his peer, he held his ground. His mind was keen. He tried his best, his curiosity alive, held his ground and let himself be caught. No harm had him been done. He faced the boy, come quickly up and closely snipped the tap. His ears belied his thoughts. They proved him curious. And so it was decided this outlaw might be tamed. Upon the day when all was set, the ground was wet and sodden through. The rain was falling wet. They pressed him through from yard to yard, accompanied by mares from foal. They slipped and slid and raced on through. But when the round yard gate was closed, he found himself alone. The mares had gone. Instead, he faced this chap again and knew him now by smell. He came right up and sniffed and fought, each wish to both. <clears throat> the quivering showed how brave he was. He stood his ground to talk. He liked this chap. He stood and stood while fears, fears allayed themselves. There was no harm in the phantoms of his fears were fleeting fast. He liked this conquering of fear and let the chap continue. His neck was stroked, his head was held and snorting discontinued. All this was certainly new. It took some faith he had acquired to stand and take all this. But ears picked forward, not a kick. His interest was a lie. For what could happen next? I do not care, he seemed to say. I have my faith. You have not hurt me yet. The boys were buoyed on with great success upon them. The morning young, <coughs> and they themselves receivers, receivers of this trust. It was so easy now. His interest did not flag. It should have been enough. A bond was made somehow, but yet another step. He waited, he waited patiently, the hawker came, and though he knew he hated this as well, his trust said, all is well. You haven't hurt me yet. The holder on the eye so bright, the shining chestnut of his coat, he seemed to show his flag was up, the flag of truth and trust. While held, he let the wires touch and touch again, his flanks and touchy hocks. Those treacherous hooves were calm, his eyes were peaceful too. But no one was content to teach in calm and steady fashion. All must be done right now, right now. The chains, the gear, the spider. The next few steps were going fast and he was unaware. While peacefully he stood there, a sinful trick was set upon him. A gang of chains were hobbled on. <clears throat> he stood, and while his eyes were rubbed and songs were sung, he stood and didn't mind at all. For such a horse, one movement could have triggered off a run. But no, he stood and stood and stood and let the chains go on with trust. He knew not what they meant until secure. The boys stepped out and certain of their slave, they jumped about, they thrashed about and flew at him with ropes. His fear came back, he crashed upon the ground, but still would answer truce upon their kind of stings. But these were few and all at once. 
take this and that and that and that. The blankets flew and several times he's cried. Outraged, he fell upon the ground. He fell so hard each time. The mud was covered on his head, his eyes, his mouth. The tongue was cut. But his torch had just begun. Up and up again and down and never left in peace. His quivering began again, but still was stored on talk. The chestnut horse looked tired, was hurt. His fears were mounted now. His adversaries mounted too, from side and back and neck. His patience lasted, his patience lasted, his lasted well, but much there was to take. Fatigued and weary now, his ter terror coming on him, he had to let them mount from aft and side, still thrusting them in part. Still thrusting them, I'm sorry, still thrusting them in part. They left him out in chains and later on returned. He really, he'd really tired now and wanted out, first thought. He fought them now intently and frightened. And this time still they bagged and hooted, mimicked well his snort. Again they left him slave now half a day, his curiosity submerged. The cursory of chains lay heavy on his heart. His chestnut coat was mud caked, his body bruised throughout. No longer friends, these foes, returned to worry him again. His nerves undone, his strength returned. He challenged chains once more. The boys had aimed at obtaining him with this infernal rush. The more ensnared, the more enraged, it sickened at the sight of them, more harm than good they brought him. Back to the wild range cult he'd gone, and terror signal strong. All actions now were panic born. They hated him, he hated them. The bond was gone forever. He raised his strength to get away, but with no legs to balance. His neck took all the mighty weight. As down he came, his noble chestnut death. Can a horse forget his freedom, a thing most uppermost, with nothing but a set of chains to replace the joy of being? They came close to try to free him, for he should be broken now and quiet and submerged. But trust him again, he had no heart for that. He cried out freedom with his last tremendous leap, that their chains <coughs> deformed into a crumpled chestnut heap. Last two words, not broken. Thank you, Doug. Um, who was the name of the poet who wrote that one? Pat Winter Irving, that's the lady there. Well, she's still in the nursing home at Arnold, aren't it? Winter Irving, okay. Thank you very much. My grandfather used to do the horse and cattle run from Bathurst to the beginning of the Gulf Country, and then he would bring the stock back from the Gulf Country to Bathurst. He did that on horseback, pretty continuously taxiing along for about uh, 15 years. Yeah. That's a lot of horse saddle. Mm -hmm. That was my mother's father. Yeah, I had to explain to my son yesterday what was a travelling stock route. That was the stock was, uh, um, Now they all travel on trucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah. as as the youngest one here tonight, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not rubbing them in, I'm just stating a fact, as the youngest poet here, I'm going to do something contemporary, one of my own, um, and finish off with something by Candy Royal, who I'll talk a little bit, speak a little bit on. Um, this is, this one's called Data the New Oil, and, um, so yeah, it's a contemporary poem written a few days ago about the value of your data and how it's used and manipulated to track you, to send you ads to, um, from everything to sending, tracking your ads, to tracking your heart rate. Um, and one example was um, one man suspected his wife was um, having an affair, so he went into her Fitbit, which showed at um, 2 a.m. every night her heart rate was going up very high. Um, but he didn't actually hack it because it was his, part, his 
wife, and you're allowed to look at your wife's data. Data, the new oil. We're going to sequence every living thing on earth. We're going to sequence everybody in the world. Are you being robbed? Are you missing out? Are you being paid? Vapour trails in the ether. Location tracking, date and time stamped. Tracked by an Apple, tracked by an Android. Ones and zeros obscuring dollar signs. Facebook builds a history of dot, 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 dot. Pop-up advertising, cross-reference credit history, income statements and location providing a seamless experience in the metaverse. Data privacy and consent. There's a lot of money in your data. Fitbit, heart rate, the price of free. Your personal data is an asset to you, or Google, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, and whatever government or corporation decided to harvest. Your data, your oil, your energy. We're living in a time when big companies want to exploit the information we've given them for free. Market value per user. The privacy crisis. Accept cookies, software and big data. The Internet of Things. Terms and conditions. Accept That's it. Um, another contemporary of mine, well, she's not really contemporary because I just turned 52. And if she was still alive, she would be turning 41 this year, um, is Candy Royale, who passed away in 2018 from cancer at the young age of 37. Um, she won many awards, and one of those was uh, the 2012 Nimbin Performance Poetry World Cup, which is an eight-minute piece of poetry that must be memorised. Um, but this is one of the... Can you perform that sometime? No, I'll play, yeah, it, I'll minute, play it on YouTube for you. Um, a trillion... Tiny awakenings. Listen to this non profit, this high priestess of poetry. No more hatred, just love. We are pure love. We are pure love. And this gathering, every gathering, is sacred. Listen. Candy Royale. A trillion tiny awakenings. Listen to this non-profit, this high priestess of poetry. No more hatred, just love. We are pure love. We are pure love. And this gathering, every gathering, is sacred. Listen. Mm. Nice. Mm. With that, I'd like to say thank you very much for coming along tonight. Thank you to everybody out there in uh, the internet world for uh, tuning in 
Worlding. Yeah. Worlding. Worlding, <laughs> yeah. All, all in the yeah. whole wide world. Yes. And um, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, like it, share it out there, and um, you'll be able to catch it in a few hours also on YouTube, uploaded to YouTube as well, if you'd like to. Look up the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame uh, YouTube channel, and there's a whole list under the videos of Wednesday Words Open Mic Poetry Night, um, also there in the videos on the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame Gaia Facebook page as well. Thank you all for coming, much appreciated, have a wonderful night. Thank you.